Hi, welcome to another video podcast. Uh, this forms number two of three of the um, quantum videos. I got that wrong in the last one. I said that photoelectric effect was two, it's one. So, in the photoelectric effect um, podcast, we established that light uh, needs to be treated as a particle, uh, a photon, um, when we're explaining the photoelectric effect. Uh, this same uh, idea that light is a photon can be uh, used to explain why the spectrum from a gas like neon, so if we take a tube of gas, we connect it to a high voltage supply, if we, the gas particles inside in response to this high voltage will give out light. When we analyse that light, we look at the spectrum of the light. Rather than if we looked at the sun, or we looked at an incandescent bulb, an ordinary bulb with a filament, we'd see a complete rainbow. We just, between the red and the blue end of the spectrum, we just see a number of brightly coloured lines. We just see a number of bright, allowed wavelengths. So we're going to try and explain why the spectrum looks like this and how this technology can be provide, used to provide lighting in a room uh, via the fluorescent strip lamps that you're quite used to seeing. To get any further, we need a, a model of an atom. It should be used to the idea that an atom has a nucleus that's positively charged and then around the nucleus um, we have electrons. Uh, and we, we can't really afford to, to, to say that the electrons are in circular orbits. We just have to imagine them uh, around the nucleus. But if we observe an electron, if we, um, we might see it here, uh, or we might see it out here, because it's just a large, we imagine an S orbital, a spherical area, where there's a good chance of finding an, uh, observing an electron. When we do observe an electron, um, if, if we keep looking at the same electron, in its ground state, wherever we see it, its total energy is a constant. So you might see it close to the nucleus, um, in which case it might have more kinetic energy. You might see how it might have less kinetic energy, but because the potential energy has changed, the, the total energy is a constant. And that's really um, very different to the ordinary everyday world. When you put the um, foot on the accelerator of an ordinary car, you're gaining kinetic energy and possibly gaining potential energy as well. You're changing the overall energy state of your car. Electrons only ever have um, a fixed amount of energy. And we can represent that on a ladder diagram. We have to be a little bit careful um, with these diagrams because um, they're not drawing a part of the atom. They're just drawing um, like a graph, some potential places... Uh, uh, energies that the electron might have. The bottom one, the bottom of the well is called n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. In fact there would be an infinite number of energy levels but they get closer and closer together so we're just going to draw a few, a few energy levels. This energy level here is called the ground state and in any normal atom under cool conditions the electrons reside in the ground state, the lowest possible energy they can have. Um, if, it, if this electron receives some energy, and we'll just go back to our fluorescent tube and think about how that might happen. So if we can imagine this as being the positive electrode, we can imagine an electron um, goes down the tube, gains a considerable amount of energy, and then it will have a collision with an atom. Uh, during that collision, it will impart some kinetic energy to, to the electron in the atom, and then a number of things can happen. If the electron gains energy, it can go up to a higher energy level. So, for example, it could absorb some energy and end up up here in the n equals 3 state. If it's given enough energy, it might go beyond the top energy level. That process is called ionisation. Then the electron is completely removed from the atom. It's no longer associated with it with it and um, as you're familiar with your work in chemistry you'll be left with uh, a positive ion. So due to a collision with an electron in our fluorescent tube we've got some electrons in higher energy states. Now that's not stable, they want to return to the ground state, they want to go back to the lowest 
possible energy state. To do that, um, then they have to lose energy. They lose energy in the form of a photon. So this is a slightly larger transition, so I'm going to draw um, perhaps a blue photon leaving here. The energy of the photon is given by E equals HF, just like we had with the photoelectric effect. So the blue energy photon is um, a larger amount of energy. Or similarly, it, the, the, there's no rules which govern the falling back down other than you have to go to the allowed energy levels. It might be that the electron only returns from n equals 3 to n equals 2. That's a smaller energy jump and therefore a lower energy photon is going to be given out. Again, E equals HF. Uh, we've got a lower energy, so we've got a lower frequency and therefore a longer wavelength of light. If we look back at um, this diagram again, so each one of these lines in the line spectra corresponds to a transition down from one energy level to another energy level. Now, of course, there might well be lines beyond the blue end of the spectrum for higher energy photons or into the infrared for lower energy photons. If we're considering um, what's occurring in a, a fluorescent tube, then, in fact, it's mercury vapour that's inside the tube in most um, commercial strip lighting, and that actually produces most of its photons in the ultraviolet end of the, end of the spectrum. So, in fact, most of the, the, the energy levels in the mercury atom are sufficiently far apart that almost all the transitions down, even going from n equals, n equals 2 to n equals 1, produce an ultraviolet photon that's invisible to the naked eye. Now that's great if you want to run a tanning saloon. Uh, if you take a strip light and you don't put that white powder on the inside, it will go slightly purple. You'll see some light at this end of the spectrum. But lots of ultraviolet light, excellent for providing skin cancer and accelerated ageing or anything else that you get to pay for at a tanning saloon. Not so good for, for lighting um, in terms of being able to see in a room. That's your B. I can't see in the ultraviolet part of, this part of the spectrum. So how do we go about converting this ultraviolet photon into photons we can see? Well, the ultraviolet photon will collide with an atom in the white fluorescent powder that lines the inside of the tube. Now, the white fluorescent powder has its energy levels much closer together than the um, energy levels in the mercury. And the electron in the ground state might absorb the photon and be moved to a higher energy level. Now, it's worth just saying there's a difference here. If an electron collides with an atom, provided it has enough energy, you can go to any of the energy states above. With a photon, it has to give all of its energy to this electron, and it has to be exactly the right amount of energy to take it exactly to, an en to a particular energy level. The, hopefully, then, the electron will return to its um, ground state in a number of jumps. Each jump is lower in energy, so each time it gives out a visible light photon, so the ultraviolet load of the tube is converted into uh, white light by, by the fluorescent coating. You'll find the, find the same fluorescent uh, material in white paper and in washing powder. Uh, so when you go outside and you see that great bluey whiteness in your shirt, what you're seeing is the uh, ultraviolet photons in the sun spectrum um, hitting uh, electrons in the white uh, left in your shirt by the um, washing powder. The electrons are moved to a higher energy level and then return in a number of jumps giving out visible light photons, and that's why uh, your clothes appear to glow. Okay, thank you very much.